Celron D, hated by everyone but oddly praised by reviewers and something that most of us have tried to forget for nearing a decade now. However, today we're actually going to find out why. Now this right here is an Intel Celeron D. Well, what's inside the boxes? Something I've been putting off reviewing and covering for a long, long, long time, and for a good reason, because I remember just how bloody terrible it was. But before we get into the specifications and the benchmarks, we're actually going to take a step back. A step back to the beginning of the century when this CPU was originally released, and find out what the hell actually happened, how did it end up actually getting released, and more importantly, was it actually that bad back in the day? So, while I set up a little test system, why don't we discuss what was actually going on with this little processor. Dawn of the summer of 2004, and Intel has just announced they're expanding their lineup. They're going to be cutting down their hot and heavy Pentium 4s, and offering them as a budget upgrade over their pre-existing Celeron series. The only thing is, we've all heard of the name Prescott, and I'd like you all to remember that for while we continue our story. Reviewers all over the world were given these processors for review, everyone was able to get their hands on them, and they were generally well praised, with all of them claiming that architecturally they were actually better than the older Celerons, which wasn't very hard to do, those things really were bad, as those things had literally 128 kilobytes of cache, so literally doubling that with this saw a lot of applications run better. And that's because they didn't spend as much time stalling, and they actually spent more time running the applications. So one of the biggest praises of them was the fact they actually worked. So reviewers starting throwing multiple star reviews at them, and admittedly during most tasks of the era, the CPU saw itself running absolutely fine against Intel's own lineup and AMD's own competition early on in its life. However, the praise only went so far, as people were quickly finding their own issues with the processors, namely heat, among other problems. But things did actually seem like they were off to a good start. Reviewers praised them, consumers could reason with the lower prices they were sold for, as these things were selling for around £35 to £45 pounds on the low end, and for a low end processor, that is surprisingly good value. Admittedly, they were also good overclockers, so people did push them up to very high clocks, not that it really helped performance too much as these were very cash limited, something I'll touch on later on, as this is really one part that threw me off. How can such a hated processor with such a terrible reputation appear to have such a solid start to life? No one touches on how good value they were back in 2004. Well, I'll tell you something. Naming. See, the next year saw the release of Intel's own Pentium D, two Pentium 4s and a single die, and something I've covered in a previous video. And around the time, the Celerons were really being pushed onto the market. Intel was pushing these things to lower-end OEMs and to sell them as cheap chips. Now, this led to a lot of confusion. See, both had the letter D at the end of them, confusing a lot of people as, was the Celeron a dual-core? Well, no, the D didn't actually stand for anything. But the D on the end of the Pentium did stand for dual-core. So this was only the beginning of the end for the Celeron D, as a lot of people were getting very confused over what they were actually buying. See, all the while this confusion was gripping the market, for most applications, AMD had released a new Sempron, which was very cheap, a better purchase, and saw anyone that was moderately computer literate actually throwing their money at the AMD processors of the day. Either way, Intel really doubled down, releasing more and more variants of the Celeron D, only confusing people more and more, to the stage where I found people on forums explaining that D on the Pentium stands for dual core, and on the Celeron it's meant to stand for disabled, as in cut down cache, because it's a disabled Pentium 4. But the thing is, they'd still recommend avoiding it because it was a misinformed purchase and something that was still pretty terrible. Many people were caught out though. I remember being younger during this era and thinking it was some sort of dual core because of the D name. Because I've heard of a Pentium D, surely the Celeron D is a cut down version of that. But no, it isn't. And the clock speed they were having, well, yes, it was clocked higher to try and make up for some of the performance deficit, but it made very little difference to real world performance, and it was becoming very rapidly outdated. Then came the beginning of the year of 2006, and the Intel Celeron D would end up with its final revision, exactly what we're going to be seeing here today. Intel ended up doubling the cache to a whopping 512 kilobytes, up from the 256 it was originally released with, and tried to make as much money as they could off of them by putting the price up quite a significant amount. And these things were selling for near as much as a dual core at the end of their lifetime. And as much as I hate to say this, the Pentium D could brute force its way through a lot of tasks because it had more cache. 
programs and programs were getting through more and more cash because they were getting more and more complex. And the cell run had 25% of the cash of a comparing Pentium that cost the exact same during this era. All in all, AMD's and Intel's own CPUs were having more of a lead because they had cash. Whereas this cell run was just getting slower and slower and slower to the stage where the processor spends most of its time pegged at 100% usage, just stalling, eating through power, and giving itself one of the most hated reputations of all time. Something a lot of people said would probably end up happening as computers got more complex. Bringing us to where we are today, where I've got a hold of one of the most powerful ones they ever made to find out if this is actually true. This right here is an Intel Celeron 352. One of the final Intel Celeron Ds I could get a hold of without having to spend any more money than I'd like to on something regarded as an utter turd of a processor. Now specifications wise it really does sound like a powerhouse. With 512 kilobytes of L2 cache, clock speeds hitting 3.2 gigahertz and a TDP of 86 watts. It actually sounds like quite a compelling little CPU. But seriously, do not let these specs fool you like it fooled a lot of people. Costing around $80 on release, this was one of the last ones you could purchase, and does have 64-bit support, is based on a newer 65 nanometer node, but cost virtually as much as a low-end Pentium D805. Now I'll also be benchmarking against a few other sub $100 processors from back in the day to give you an idea of how poor value this actually was. But today I just had to spend £3 on this processor. I did actually offer the eBay seller £2 to try and save some money to maybe go to Greg's and buy a sausage roll instead of this sad excuse of a CPU. But all in all I did end up spending all £3 on it. So aren't you guys lucky? Today we're going to be pairing this with an AMD Fury and also a GTX 650 just to verify there's no other performance changes by using a different vendor's card. And trust me, there is no bottleneck as I did test with both. I'm also using 8GB of DDR2 800MHz RAM and an SSD. I've also gone to the liberty of testing four different operating systems, mostly because I couldn't believe how terrible this was with the first one. And no matter what I did, Things just wouldn't get better, but we'll touch on that later on. For now, let's actually throw some games at this thing. So, let's start things off with a game that you'd actually think would run okay, but instead it actually took just over 10 minutes to load us into a game, by which point everyone else has already moved on to the next game, so for some reason we were left in an empty map. This is of course CSGO, which ran very poorly, but could occasionally see double digits in terms of frame rates. And don't you worry, I did actually record those load times because they are definitely a huge factor here. The CPU struggles with virtually anything going on, so much so that loading is a challenge for it. Either way, the game did technically run, but I wouldn't exactly say it ran well. Next off with GTA 5, which took nearly an hour to load. I kid you not, I was sat here for 46 minutes, making sure the processor didn't off itself trying to load in the game. But once the game did load up, it seemed to run okay. As long as run meant you just ran into things because the input lag was so bad. It spent most of its time hitching up and causing you to run into random objects, and as I continued to play, things just got worse and worse and worse and worse. So yeah, not a great experience again, and I also had to close MSI Afterburner just to show you the performance you're seeing on screen. MSI Afterburner wouldn't run in the background because of how full this CPU is running this title. Another relatively modern title that is crazy impressive to see loaded on this CPU, which most effects didn't seem to load in properly on the processor and everything did end up looking rather dark. MSA Afterburner also refusing to launch in the background with this one, but take my word for it, it didn't run well at all here. I'd like to think that game optimizations played a huge part in getting us this far, but honestly we saw this run better on the Pentium D of the same era, which didn't cost much more. So don't count me surprised to see it boot here. Still, it did, and I'll actually give it some credit for this. It did launch the Master Chief Collection, and it did launch GTA as you just saw. Finally, we saw something playable with Terraria. With frame rates about as unstable as it gets, the game did actually manage to see some level of playability in the early game. That is, once you were into the game as generating a world took its fair share of time as did actually getting through the menus and waiting for the game to install. When anything was going on at all, our FPS would tank horribly, and it's not something you'd expect from a processor having to run a 2D game. This is not a difficult game to run, I've seen this run on far worse hardware, at least on paper. 
it's just really struggling here. Half-Life 2 is not a hard game to run, and even with lower settings than I'd usually like to use for my benchmarks, we saw a not all too playable experience in my opinion. I mean, don't get me wrong, this usual benchmarking area is a very hard area to render on a lower end processor, as it's a larger open area, but still, this should run absolutely fine. This is worse performance than I'm pretty sure I saw on my Northwood Pentium 4. But still, we would end up seeing some degree of performance increase in smaller areas. But then again, gunfights and physics effects would hamper the performance. And all in all, this is just really not good at all. So before someone says, oh, you're being really harsh to this processor, you're only testing modern releases and the modern release of Half-Life 2, here is the most ideal case you could imagine, the original Half-Life 2. And the performance increase, yes it is there, but it's not as much as you people would usually think, with wide expanses and lighting and shadow effects causing major slowdown in certain areas, which does make up a large portion of Half-Life's actual gameplay, especially the physics effects, it certainly wasn't a playable experience, at least not what you'd expect from an $80 processor that came out two years after this game was released. And this is the release version here. All in all, it really should be performing better than this. Skyrim is a game that is indeed playable on most processors of this era. The lower end Core 2 Duos which came out, the Pentium Ds can run it okay, and even a few Pentium 4s. But it didn't take much for me to say that this processor is not one of those. It is absolutely terrible here and can be seen from the moment the actual gameplay starts. I wasn't fortunate enough to actually see this game out to the sunlight due to the stuttering actually being a problematic and it ended up causing me to tab out after two minutes because I actually hit alt tab two minutes before the menu actually showed. All in all, not a great showing, not a great experience and something that really should be running here. Finally, I thought I would round off with Minecraft which did not run nicely at all. Now, this was the latest version of the game, and if you went back to one of the betas or something like that, you would likely see a performance increase and it would run a little bit better. But I'm going to be honest here, this game is not exactly the most intensive thing in the world, and I've seen this run okay on some processors from this era, at least achieving 30 to 60 FPS with lower settings like we're using here. But this is just abysmal. The game took forever to load, and I spent as much time just trying to generate this world as I did benchmarking it. All in all, not fun, and once again, another disappointment. So, there you have it, some more modern benchmarks actually tested on the Pentium D, and a few that even dated back to 2004, before this processor actually came out. And now I know some of those tests might have seemed incredibly harsh considering that we knew this thing was going to be a bit of a potato, but keep in mind, I threw more than this at processors of the same age and nearly the exact same cost, and those didn't seem to struggle anywhere near this hard. To give you an idea of how this thing ran compared to its competition back in the day, well I actually went out and got you some results, and here they are. The only area you ever see of the Celeron D actually tend to beat anything was in Quake 3, where a clock speed advantage and the game is heavily single threaded, so it's not exactly going to be using the Pentium D's second core. Now, all of these processors end up costing the exact same amount, but it puts into perspective just how poor this processor performs against the competition of the same age. But I can already see the comments. But budget builds. You didn't test X or Y operating system, even though you said you did. Oh, I did. I benchmarked across Windows XP, Windows 7, Windows 10, and Lubuntu for Linux. And you know what? It was a potato across the board with very little difference shown across all three operating systems on Windows and Linux included, which tended to perform worse. So that was ruled out completely. And you can imagine how long it took me to get these benchmarks with the amount of loading it took. And talking about loading, I have the average load times I recorded for the games that at least took a long time to load. I was monitoring resource uses just to make sure the programs hadn't crashed. And indeed, they looked like they'd locked up. But no, that was just the Celeron pipeline stalling while it loaded in all these colossal modern games. But keep in mind, some of these games aren't actually all too huge and they're not all too modern. So this puts it into perspective that it's really, really bad and has been since its release. Then again, this CPU isn't just for gaming. I mean, not all processors are just for gaming. And I know plenty of you already typed out an angry comment telling me this, and I really wanted to believe that maybe this processor could redeem itself somewhere. Maybe it can't just run games, maybe it can do operating system tasks absolutely fine. And even if it is just to make my life easier testing this. But across the board, 
none of the operating systems saw a consistently smooth experience. I'll give Windows XP credit, it was the smoothest and is a contemporary operating system for this processor, so it was kind of expected. But running any tasks or even moving task manager around the screen would see 100% utilization spikes and could see certain parts of the desktop lag out and something that you don't see when you use older Pentiums, they can deal with this. All in all, it's down to that lack of any real cash. With more modern operating systems, the same thing was the case. Now, don't get me wrong, it was certainly usable for a few day-to-day -day tasks, but as I said, even programs way back as 2006 were getting far too complex for half a megabyte of L2 cache. So nowadays, it's the same story, but it's even worse. I'll give it some credit here or there, as you could browse the web on it, regardless of the operating system you want to use, but we would see hitches and freezes on heavy pages, and don't expect to do any multitasking, you don't have any threads left to do anything like that. Word processing worked okay, but would lag occasion on Windows 10 and 7, and even hitched up a little bit on Linux. I will give it credit for video playback, as you can watch 360p YouTube with a plugin, regardless of the operating system once again, so not great, but it can decode SD videos. Not great really though, is it, considering we've seen the Pentium 4s and Pentium Ds deal with HD video before. Not all too impressed. By now, I was really starting to hate this little thing, as it just couldn't seem to do anything it should be able to do. I just couldn't click how Intel could make a processor this bad. So I thought I'll turn to my community for thoughts and opinions on the Celeron D, see if anyone had anything redeeming to say, and virtually everyone echoed the same experience I'd been having for the last few days. The few people that did actually like them were overclockers, as a lot of you are probably already going to tell me, who admittedly had pushed these things to crazy clocks. But the cache was just such a limit, it hardly saw any performance increase. But people weren't doing it for the performance, they were overclocking it because it was one, cheap, and two, could be pushed to these clocks, it was a fun thing to do. All in all, it's a disappointment and a confusing one. What well, started off as a decent low-end budget buy in its early life, ended up selling for twice its original price, with a confusing name, performance that's genuinely painful to try and use, and honestly, this might be the first time I struggle to find anything redeeming to say about a product I've been using. So, there we have it, the Intel Celeron D. Not just any Celeron D, one of the last and the best ones to ever exist. So I'm pretty sure we can all imagine how the ones with half this cache are holding up today, like the one I used for a couple of years. Honestly, for retro games pre-2005, it can do okay, and that is its redeeming factor. It did perform like a Pentium 4 when you were running basic tasks pre-2004. You know, because it virtually was a Pentium 4. The thing is, by 2006, it was just struggling, and they kept on selling and selling and selling and selling. And I just couldn't figure out why Windows XP would even lag. But it's just all down to the fact these things can't cope with modern tasks. Even back in the day, people were saying that you can't fit that much into that little cache, at least with the way NetBurst works. All in all, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the demise and disappointment that was the Celeron D. I've struggled to find anything redeeming about it, I've tested everything I can, and all in all, it's Intel's mistake, it's our worst purchase, and just a bad processor. Good night.